could have just. Okay. Doesn't count. Do you? Because of you, how is. Slide show. Slide show. Number for one support. Two. Okay, so can we ask you in the office space to facilitate discussion with cool. the second? Yeah, done. Hey, um, are you going to introduce? Yeah, good. Cool. I can talk a lot, but I'm just going to keep it simple. Cool, yeah, no worries. that Agile Auckland is going to focus on is pretty much the open networking. We want the community to be more involved. And for that, we are going to have various um, initiatives that we are going to try to shape. Um, one will be like try and have networking uh, put before the event, like we talked more. And then we have speed introductions and open evening type sessions. But this is all going to happen um, over the next couple of events. So this event, the restrooms are outside the door. There's restrooms on this side and that side. This side and that side, very easy. Um, and uh, the fire exit is right out and then near the car park and the grass. Timing, um, Edwin is going to be the speaker today and he is pretty much looking at 45 minutes, and then we will have uh, 15 to 20 minutes of open space. <coughs> open space, this is quite new. We were supposed to have question and answers. Instead of question and answers, we are experimenting open space. Casper, Casper is our membership portfolio person, and he suggested that instead of having question and answers, let's experiment something new so we are going to have open space, the, but it is only 15 minutes. So the idea is try to read questions on uh, Slido. There is the password and our, I'm blank. Uh, that is our uh, user ID. And so if you could put your questions on and then vote on it, the top four questions will be our agenda items. So that's going to be our agenda, and then open space is going to be 15 minutes. We'll try and see if we can fix it in 15 minutes. And then um, Casper is going to do a quick summary. And before we go any further. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I actually wanted to introduce Edwin, but I know 90% of you don't know. So, I just wanted to say it's my great privilege to hand it over to him, and it's amazing to hear from such an expert. Over to you. Thank 
you. That's a lovely introduction. <laughs> um, I don't quite know what's happened to the order of these slides, but let's just sort of see how it goes. Um, so, yeah, randomly, this is my family. <laughs> um, I think this is my introduction slide. Yes, it is. So, um, um, this is my family. This is who I am. Um, my, my lovely wife and my three boys, uh, we live a very, very um, full-on lifestyle. Um, life for us starts at about 6.15 most mornings and doesn't end until uh, late in the evening, tidying up after them. Um, I live on an um, organic farm 45 minutes north of Auckland. I try to live um, self-sufficiently and grow as much of our food as possible. And the reason I bring this up in an Agile talk is I have a strong belief in living a lot of the Agile values. And I trust my children here to do life daring things with me. Um, so, but, and try and give them responsibility and let them fail, which on a farm is a really neat way to live because children can experiment and play and they're not wrapped up in cotton wool, which is one of my core beliefs around how we help grow people. Um, so yeah, here's some pictures of my garden. Um, I try and, and grow lots and lots of my own food and I love going fishing. Um, one of my biggest things I love doing in my life is to get up at dark Launch a, launch a boat by myself, go out to the middle of the ocean where if anything goes wrong, there's no one to blame but me, and uh, see if I can come back with some food. And I get a huge rush out of being on, on the ocean at sunrise. Um, one of the other things I get a real kick out of is I teach children computer science. Um, this is my nine-year-old son, Henry. Um, and I try and teach them, um, if any of you know Dr. Tim Bell down in Canterbury, he, uh, Canterbury Uni, he wrote a program called CS Unplugged which is Computer Science Unplugged. And it's a program that allows children to learn computer science without computers. So for example, we spent a, um, a few hours going through how pixels work and what a pixel is and, and going through all the concepts, but we do it in a very tangible way using um, things that we'd often use in agile training, like we go out to the netball co court and use hula hoops and chalk and go through sorting algorithms by going through steps and they, they learn concepts. And um, it's really cool. The children pick up a lot of these things incredibly quickly. And the reason this is important to me is the children, the skills children need in the future are going to be radically different from what we do today. And I think it's really important that we start thinking around more as an agile community, not just around what we do in our workplaces, but how we spread this thinking further out into our community. Um, as my day job, I work as I'm the GM of Assurity Auckland. Um, I run the Auckland branch. Um, I've uh, run my own company, which Assurity purchased in 2012, and broadly there's a, the few key things we do. Um, we either help companies improve what they do, or we completely transform them into something quite new. Um, and, and really, at the basis of a lot of what we do is an agile mindset. But that, I haven't come here to talk to you about Assurity. The, the objective of today, <coughs> um, I've been at this thing for a hell of a long time. Um, I know Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland very well. I spend time with them every year. I know a lot of the people, and I've met a lot of the people that have signed the Agile Manifesto. Um, Agile's being used everywhere. It's a term everywhere we go as a consultancy, we see it. Um, it's often being used incredibly poorly. Um, it's often being used very, very prescriptively and rigidly. Uh, and it's often being used without a real understanding behind the mindset and the philosophy behind it. And it results, and I'm sure all of you have been in this, where it, it can often result in Agile being thought of really badly or, or, or failing. Um, so it's a real passion of mine. Um, I, I, a lot of people are, are tasked with suddenly implementing Agile in their firms, and they're given a book at best and told to read it over the weekend, and it's somehow supposed to magically change the organization. So I wanted to do a little bit of a reset here. Um, the, 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 there's that and the fact that what we've noticed in our member base is there's a lot of people coming to workshops or coming to these events and they're sort of struggling with some of the, the, the basics. So I thought, let's go through and reset right from, from the, the basics. What is Agile? What is it about? Um, and that's something that we can build on. So I hope I try and achieve that objective tonight. Um, <clears throat> I want to start talking around why. Um, it's always a sort of really interesting point to start why, because it, it drives why, why would we even try this new thing? It's, we all know it's kind of hard getting people to take it up. Why would we even try and attempt to convince an organization to change how it works? Um, if you think back to the way we worked last century, 
the way we worked was very much like this production line kind of system. That the, the, the objectives of, of, the, the, of management were to try and make things as efficient as possible. And management in itself as a concept really became popular in the early 1900s, 1902, 1903. A chap called Frederick Taylor wrote a book called Scientific Management. And what the original management was created by engineers. They, they had a belief that people could be like cogs in a machine that could be turned up, turned down, swapped in, swapped out. And it's because the world they lived in was this sort of world. The, the, the systems were designed for mass economies of scale. It was about efficiencies to get huge amounts of goods to people to improve their standard of living. You know, think industrial age, think of the differences of what occurred in that age. Everyone had wanted to have a motor, uh, an automobile, and the best way to do that on mass is produce very similar ones. So the idea in these sorts of production systems was to remove variability. It was considered an enemy. It was all about consistency. So it's a very efficient system for mass production. Um, very, very good for, for pumping out thing, a lot of things. But its challenge is it was very difficult to change if someone wanted something different. It was very uh, challenging to do that. And um, there were very, very long lead times. You had to sort of wait until your thing came out the end of the production line. And ultimately, the goal of this was predictability, which was what they're after. So their business was highly predictable. But if you think about where we are today, in the, in the idea, in the world where things are constantly moving all the time and we're trying to compete against others, then predictability equals death. So in warfare, when, a, when, a, when an army fights to, to achieve some sort of objective, it has a goal that it wants to head towards, it has a series of teams that get given just an objective, and then they get given the freedom and teams to communicate with another, one another and inspect and adapt to the landscape in front of them and dynamically change their plan in order to hit an objective. They don't get given this. And the reason is because if they got given that, they would last about 30 seconds and they'd be dead because they're predictable. So in, in this day and age, businesses are becoming, this, this is the reality of our business world now. If you are predictable as a business, it's pretty easy to beat you because we just have to figure out what you're going to do and do it better. So think about this quote that came out recently from Gartner. A third of businesses today won't survive the next 10 years. You know, you could play this back to the, any of the revolutions we've had. The Industrial Revolution. Look at the jobs that no longer exist. You know, the matchmaker or, I don't know, whatever it was that you did. So we're going through another one of those radical transformations right now, and there is going to be significant disruption. So being a very predictable, stable business makes you phenomenally brittle, and it makes you phenomenally susceptible to being disrupted. So, um, yeah, remember these guys. Anyone, what thoughts on Kodak? Anyone sort of was loyal to the Kodak brand? Yeah, it was a great, great thing that a lot of us were really into. Same real buzz with Blackberry, you know, think of execs with their Blackberries. Um, Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix and never took it. Nokia had the opportunity where they were presented a flat screen phone with no buttons, and they said, yeah, not important at the moment, delay it. And look at where it ended, it ended up for them. So the ability to change has become so paramount that I make the argument that now delivery trumps strategy. That having the perfect plan is no longer sufficient. The ability to be able to deliver and pivot and change as you need trumps strategy because you can have an adaptive strategy. So these guys couldn't change fast enough. So if we go back to Darwin, the, the whole one of the Darwin's key concepts is that it wasn't the strongest species that survived, it was that that could adapt the fastest. So why Agile? It allows us to be able to adapt, and that is the, the key concept underlying it. So this is sort of the, the picture I have in my mind when I think about those companies. There's a lot of organisations that, that and, you know, I'm, I'm never going to name names, but I can quite comfortably say I spend a lot of time speaking to a lot of people with silver hair who are standing on top of organisations that are facing this. They're very nervous about how they're going to cope with the future 
where the platform around them is starting to catch fire. So um, let's just do a quick exercise. Um, we'll just do a really crude model. I want to do get a feel for, uh, do you think you're really manoeuvrable? Do you think that you're kind of middle manoeuvrable? Or do you think that you are kind of like on an oil tanker that you know, takes miles to, before it can change course? So let's start with the uber highly manoeuvrable. Who in the room here is feeling that they're in a really manoeuvrable situation? Okay, it's probably, I don't know, eight, ten. Uh, in the middle, who's sort of feeling that they're working the, okay, so a reasonable collection. Who feels they're working on a sort of more of an oil tanker, very difficult to change? Oh, yeah, probably, it's probably a really awkward question to ask you in case you've got colleagues around. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I, we, we, we know, um, work with execs doing um, agile thinking for executives. Um, this, this question is what keeps most CEOs up at night. The one, one, one said to me, he said, it's like I'm standing on the top of a ship, holding onto the wheel, and it's a really big ship, full of people I love and care about, and I turn the wheel, I see an iceberg coming, I turn the wheel, and nothing happens. That's what keeps me awake at night. It's not the ability to see the, the icebergs or the impediments, it's the ability to turn and manoeuvre them. And when I do turn, the rest of the organisation turns with me. So that's what, what concerns them. So um, to me, that's, in my mind, what Agile is. That's the why. That's why we do this. A lot of people think, you know, we do this because of um, it gives us the ability to change software. Yes, but increasingly, um, we're finding a lot, a lot of our work is well and truly outside of software. It's around how do we make our organisations more Agile. So to me, that is the underlying thing that, that covers everything. It covers software, it covers business. It's the ability to be able to change. So if we sit, um, I, I, I saw this come through on Twitter um, just recently. It was just last month. And I actually thought it was really, really interesting. Um, a lot of people, f is, this is from um, Jim Coplain, who's um, one of the sort of really old-time <coughs> agilists. Um, a lot of people think that Scrum and XP came out of the Agile Manifesto, whereas the reality is they actually fed the Agile Manifesto. It sort of wasn't as clean and simple as a bunch of people got together in a log cabin and came up with an epiphany and they went, oh, here's some cool philosophies that are going to last 16 years or 20 years. Um, let's put these together and, and hopefully we all go off and develop really nice frameworks that work with them. It didn't really work like that. The, there was a bunch of things that led up to um, Agile. Toyota production systems right back into the 50s um, of, of the idea of quality being paramount that if there was a problem in the production line, anyone had the ability to stop the line and be able to, to make sure that we didn't continue work on something that was faulty, because that's dumb. We have to go back and do rework, and that creates failure demand. Um, the concept of object-oriented programming was a huge influence, because it allowed us to be able to work on pieces of software in isolation and allow um, tight cohesion and, and low coupling. The new new product development game, this sort of seminal article that Jeff Sutherland tripped over that led to some of the thinking around Scrum came out in 1986. Um, the Gang of Four Design Patterns concepts came out in the late 90s. Again, helped us sort of progress towards Agile. Um, Jeff Sutherland's original trials at Easel Corporation using Scrum were 1993. And um, then Kent Beck um, and Ward Cunningham came up with the extreme programming concepts, which kind of took a lot of this thinking into a more engineering land and helped people who were actually writing software to come use these concepts. And then ultimately that led to the Agile Manifesto in 2001. I thought that was quite interesting because a lot of people don't get that order. A lot of people think that this thing came first and it, you know, then this, then this, or, or similar. Um, and to support that, um, I, I had Jeff Sutherland out here in 2010 and he shared this with me and I thought it was really interesting. It's an email from Kent Beck, look at the date on it. Um, in 1995, so is there a good place to get reprints of the Scrum paper from Harvard Business Review? I'm writing patterns for something very similar and I want to make sure I steal as many ideas as I can. So I mean, they were, these guys were collaborating, but this is, you know, this is well and truly pre-manifesto, this is late 90s. So then the manifesto itself, I'm sure many of you have seen this, it, it, it is really a, a, a set of principles 
And this is the underlying challenge we have with Agile. That manifesto is an abstract, conceptual thing by nature. It is non-prescriptive. It doesn't tell you how to do Agile. It tells you what the mindset and the thinking behind it is trying to achieve. And the challenge with that is lots of people have gone out and struggled. They want more. People want something to follow that gives them that outcome. So they tend to reach for things in a more recipe book kind of prescriptive manner. And that's where we often see the really rigid, forced, uh, dogmatic um, applications of Scrum or, or other agile frameworks is, is that gap between what people understand now and the abstractness of, a, of something like a manifesto. But the key thing, um, to me this is absolutely fundamental. Agile is not a process. Um, and, and it's fantastic that there's lots of people out there trying to implement a process because, to be frank, it generates lots of work for people like me to come along and fix because it doesn't work. It's as simple as that. Agile is a mindset. We must get our minds around how to accept ambiguity, to not plan everything perfectly up front, to accept there will be change, to embrace that change, and to be able to put in systems that provide transparency so that everyone can see what the hell is going on without the need for overly detailed and wasteful plans. That's what Agile is about. It's a mindset wrapped by a set of values, which I just showed in the manifesto, that are wrapped around a core set of 12 principles that back up the manifesto, that then are supported by a number of practices, which are then collected into a series of different methods or frameworks. Scrum, Kanban, XP, feature-driven development, whatever the hell you want to use. Don't be fooled by going out and trying to implement Agile at this level only. You will end up with a hollow implementation that at some point will collapse because the core mindset and the thinking style behind it won't work. And I'm sure many of you have been through this, right? You've gone back, bushy-eyed, star, starry-eyed, bushy-tailed, woohoo, I've been through scrum training, I'm gonna go in and, and, and start this now, and you get your team going, and things are going well, and then you run up against number of organizational impediments, a PMO, a management group, a broader organization that doesn't understand what the hell you are doing. And it's because we haven't thought about this mindset and values of the organization and reaching out further and helping people think differently. So this slide comes from um, Ahmed Sidki, um, who's a very, very interesting chap. He, he's director of development at Riot Games um, over in, in the States and um, a long-serving agilist. Um, and I really like that this concept. I mean, his view is he led the agile transformation at Veras and Wireless. And um, in his first 18 months of that transformation, all they did is focus on collaboration. So they focused here on the mind, agile mindset around collaboration. They didn't even do iterations. They didn't go out and start doing stand-ups. They just focused on a culture of collaboration. So they approached it, I mean, if, if we think of it as sort of approaching it with a, a, almost a vertical, like we're gonna go out and do this thing called Scrum, he approached it from a total tangential angle. He came in and said, actually, we're gonna focus on, across everything, a mindset first. Let's not worry about a framework. So quite a different way of thinking about Agile. We're going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, oh, or now. Have a quick look at this while I grab a drink of water. Um, so if we start with this concept that Agile is a way of thinking, it's a mindset, that um, particularly in our software world, the Agile Manifesto is largely targeted at software. Um, there's the four key values, so four key values here, grounded by 12 principles, the 12 principles, and manifested into sort of a concrete world that we can play with and use around an unlimited set of practices, new practices being developed all the time, new ideas coming up all the time, the frameworks that we know are merely a collection of these practices. It's all they are. So Scrum is a collection of useful practices, as is XP, as is Kanban, as is any of them. 
The key thing is though, starting out just doing this does not by default give you this. We need to be starting with this and then finding these that work for us. Does that make sense? Has anyone got any questions? Because it's a very, very key point. Has anyone got any questions or thoughts or comments on, on that point? No? Okay. So um, I hauled this out of the latest version 1 survey. Um, it always sort of varies somewhere between 55 and 70% um, of, of organisations use Scrum or Scrum and XP. Um, it has become the, the most default, but there's, there's um, um, some people here using custom hybrid, um, Scrum Barn, which is sort of the idea of Kanban with the um, added benefit of iterations in some of the Scrum ceremonies. 5% um, are using true Kanban, and then it sort of goes into a small collection of, of ones that are either I don't know or I use it pure XP or, or whatever. But you can see over the years that Scrum has become the dominant framework. And it, my, my experience has mainly been with Scrum. I'm a trainer with Scrum.org. I, I, I spend a lot of time connecting into the Scrum community. My personal belief is that the reason that Scrum has been so successful is you can almost go to the shelf and pull a shoebox off the shelf, take it away, on the, put it down on the table, lift the lid, you can pull the pieces out and you can kind of figure it out. There's three little roles there that, that make sense and you can read the description of them and there's sort of five key events that you can understand and read how they work and you know, there's three key artefacts and you can read about those and understand how they work. Um, I think that's the reason it's probably been the most successful is because it's the most accessible and it's been reasonably well packaged to, to be understood. Actually, why don't we see if we can reflect and see if we can get a measure um, of in the room whether this is even remotely close. Who would say, for a show of hands, for those of you, actually let's start with her, how many of you are doing Agile? Can I get a show of hands? It's probably half. Of those, can I keep your, keep your hand up if you're doing Scrum? So yeah, it's some of the vast majority. Kanban? Yeah, so reasonable number. Um, XP? Mm, that's a real shame. That's a real, real shame. And the reason is XP is, I mean, let me rephrase it this way. What happens when you leave the daily scrum, the daily stand-up? What are the techniques that people use when their fingers touch the keyboard and they start writing and testing code? Like unit testing and shared code ownership and continuous integration um, and test automation. Those are the things of XP. And to be frank, that's where the rubber hits the road with Agile. And what I've just seen in the room, I'm not trying to insult you, but it's pretty much the default for the industry. Everyone invests in the project management area of Agile. The wrapper around it, no one invests in the people who actually write software, which is a real crying shame. Um, so the key point I want you to take from this, there is no methodology called Agile. I am sick to death of hearing people talk about the Agile methodology or the Agile process. It doesn't exist. Ask that person who tells you about the Agile process to please draw it for you. Invariably, they'll draw Scrum. There is no Agile process. It is just a philosophy. That's all Agile actually is. So I want to sort of, um, um, I'm a bit of a pitchers thinker. So I, I, I put this together to try and show how I tend to think of the difference between a waterfall project and an Agile project. If we have time going this way, a, a, a traditional waterfall project goes through its key phases. We do all of the analysis and we get a nice big document. Then we do all of the design, which often means going back and fixing all the things that were wrong in the analysis. And again, we get a nice big document and some pretty pictures. And we get an architecture diagram and all of that. We then do, try to do all of the coding and then find that the previous two steps are normally wrong and go back and rework those as we do this one as well. And once we've done all the coding, we then do all the testing, and it just exponentially gets worse, because we find that not only was the code wrong, but the design and the analysis before it was probably wrong as well. So we tend to bake in waste and rework in problems. And we think of it very, very sequentially. And if you think back to the VW production line, this is a, a manifestation of that thinking in our software world. We do this. I screw the door on, and then I finish doing my job, 
and it goes to the next guy who puts the window on, and so on and so forth. We're not thinking about the whole, we're thinking about our piece of the problem. Sure. It's a good question. I mean, I think about, um, if you go right back to, and I can't believe I'm going to say this in this audience, PMI, um, what, what the project, what the, 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 yeah, no, the, the, the definition of a project by PMI is a, is a what is it, a, a, a unique endeavour, um, a, a temporary endeavour to create a unique product or service. Yeah, so it's a temporary endeavour, it has a, has a beginning and an end, and it creates a unique product or service. You never really do the same project twice. So unless you are sort of really doing the same project twice, then I don't know why you'd use this. Um, and even, interestingly, people go, well, what about a, a legacy rewrite? What about porting an app off COBOL onto .NET? But the interesting thing is, statistically, rewrites have a higher failure rate than Greenfield software projects. So it's sort of, I don't know of one. I, I, I don't know why you would, you, uh, you would ever be in a situation where you think you can perfectly analyse everything and nothing will change. I haven't been through one of those. Right, I, I think of um, I think of software as a craft more than an, uh, a science. I think it's a creative endeavour, and when you try and you imagine going to a, a, a great writer or a painter, and telling them to go through this process to, to produce their end product, they would pay themselves laughing at you. Um, and and that's what I I mean I think about all the the, the wonderful software developers I've worked with over the years. They're, they're generally a mixture of a, of a good engineering brain, but a very strong creative brain as well. And I, I completely agree with you. I mean, and the big argument against this whole model has, was, um, there's, but there was some interesting stats came out in 2002 at the XP conference and have it recently, interestingly, be re, been revalidated. And that is that somewhere between sort of 60 and 65% of features that we write for customers, they don't use. So when we do this, without an ability to have a feedback loop back from the customer around what's valuable, we bake in two-thirds waste. And we bake it in further each step. We then double bake it, triple bake it, and quadruple bake it. So we're just baking more and more and more and more waste. And you, you're right, the, the whole government procurement process is a, is a disaster. Um, I mean, personally, as a consultancy, we barely ever respond to RFPs because it's kind of pointless. Um, you just, we, we, we can't work in a way where we feel we can add the most value. I mean, we do respond to them, but we have to be very, very selective around, you know, do we really think we've got a shot at this? Because the process in itself is pretty much flawed. Yeah. Well, there's a whole group in Wellington working on that now. Um, I know Don Christie from the open source movement is sort of trying to lead the charge to say, we need a better procurement model because if you're serious about this, it's got to change. So yeah, you're, you're on the money. So we sort of do this and meanwhile, along comes someone and says, right, how are we doing? Some sort of stakeholder, manager somewhere wants to know, how far through this thing are we? And you know, it's often when it's got to this point because the further we go through this, the, the, the less visibility we typically have. So at the beginning of a project, it's all visible, right? We're talking about it, everyone's got a vision, they go, oh, we're gonna do this awesome new product and it's gonna make us this much money and it's gonna be amazing and there's lots of visibility. 
And then slowly throughout the project, visibility declines and declines and declines. To this point here, we're the only people who really know what's going on are the people who are writing code and the testers. And then finally at the end, when we release the product, we have visibility because we can use it. So often and somewhere in this sort of, typically in the code test phases where executives and managers get really nervous and they start wanting to know how's the thing going, we've spent a few million and is it looking okay? And, um, and we get this sort of question and, and often the answer is something like, oh, it's 67 or 42 or 71.2% done, which doesn't really mean a hell of a lot. And when we finally do get to hand the keys over when the thing's done, it's often a complete lemon because of what we said earlier. We, we didn't listen to the customer. We didn't involve their input and we've all seen the tire picture that, you know, what the what the customer wanted and what the designer designed and what the coder developed and so on and so forth, what the customer actually got. It's sort of a, a, a pretty embarrassing track record in our, in our industry of failures um, and failing to deliver what customers actually value. And interestingly, when you look into this whole world of, of, of digital and what this actually means, a, a key cornerstone of digital is customer centricity. It's delivering valuable pieces of, of, of stuff to your customer across multiple different experiences from a phone to a browser to a car to whatever. And you just, you just can't do it that way. You, you, your chances of success that way are, are very, very low. So if we think around how we think about this in an agile world, we would kind of tip the whole thing on its head by 90 degrees. And we'd approach it with a complete different style of thinking. And we'd say, well, we still need to do this stuff, right? We still need to understand the, what it's going to do and design it, and we need to do some coding and some testing. But instead, we break it up into small features or slices of what we need to be able to give customers. And we can go out and deliver each one of these slices and get feedback. So that when someone comes along and says the how are we doing question, we can look at this with confidence and say something like, five things are 100% done, finished, and can be used by the customer now. They're in production. Done. Ten things haven't been started. We know where we're at. The, there is no 72%. There is this stuff's done, this stuff isn't. It's quite clear. There's probably an also another piece in there that this stuff is in progress. This is what's in the sprint now. It's either hasn't been worked on, it's in the sprint, or it's done. Those are the three states. Even more interestingly, when we actually have that level of transparency, our, our friend, the product owner, or the person working with the customer can look and say, yeah, that last feature there that we delivered, not so well received by the customer. Wasn't quite what they were looking for. Um, I think we need to do something differently, guys. Yet, the only time we would have ever have done that in Waterfall was at the end, where there's no chance to actually have a change, which is, when you think about it, pretty dumb. So that's the sort of really simple way that I think of an, of an Agile project. It's just approaching it with a different mindset. Small pieces of software regularly to done. Um, what then we often see um, over and over again is an organisation, uh, an organisational pattern called the Scrum Sandwich where Scrum is being done in, in, in the delivery part, but it's being wrapped by waterfall thinking. And I'll show you what, what I mean by that. If we think of three stages, business, delivery, and operations. In the business world, what we'll often get when a project or a product is being planned is a very waterfall mindset, where we have to sit down and we go, we need a big, heavy upfront plan. We need to think about all the requirements that the customer might use. We'd better spec it all out beautifully. We're going to have to fix the budget because you know, we need to know all this stuff in advance. And what that generally tends to encourage then is a culture of more of fear where people are really scared of change because they've been having to predict everything up front. If they get it wrong, it's considered a really bad thing. That then creates a no stuff ups culture which is what we'd call a, a fail-safe culture rather than a safe-to-fail culture, where we're trying to, at all costs, prevent anything ever being wrong, including our predictions. So that also leads to a don't-challenge culture. Just do what it says in the bloody plan, thank you very much. What that tends to lead to, then, is a huge set of artefacts in one big batch that says, all right, we've thought about the project, we've got the money, we've got all the requirements, we know what we want to do, and we'll just use Agile to deliver that. 
And so in the meantime, our friend, the customer here, is sitting there going, oh, this thing that the salespeople have been telling me about, well, it's been a few months, I'm wondering what's going on. Even if we do use something like Scrum to deliver, and we, we tick up our features, unless those features go to the customer, we have failed to get any benefit out of our job. All we've done is use it to deliver. Yes, we can look at these things and potentially go back and rework these, but value happens when this person opens their wallet and pays for the feature. That's when value occurs. So all of this at the moment has just been cost. And the reason this often happens, this cue here, is because we've got a waterfall style of thinking in our operational department as well. Again, where the idea, the, 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 the classic ops department is this idea of we don't want releases of software. They always break everything, so we want them as least frequently as possible. We only want to receive software every six months or every month at most, so go away. They, they tend to have a break-fix culture. We're sick of crappy software being delivered because it's been rushed or poorly thought about, and it makes our life hell because we have to get up at three in the morning when everything explodes. That then leads to IT being thought of, or ops being thought of as a cost to the business, not a value. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not taking the mickey out of ITIL, but I'm saying that in general, ITIL tends to encourage those types of behavior where we generally think about processing work in large batches. So finally then, if we do manage to convince ops to deploy, it goes across in one large batch, and we still get the same damn result. The first time the customer sees it is when they get everything at once. So that is not an agile organization. That's an organization that has used agile in here to try and make delivery go better, but is leaving the majority of the value on the table. Um, IT infrastructure library. Um, it's a sort of process framework for managing operations. If we think about the mindset of an agile company, it's a little bit different. Rather than come, coming up with a massive big plan of everything that we want to do up front, we would start with a reasonably strong concept of vision of what it is we want to achieve. And we would tend to accept that there is going to be ambiguity, and that's fine. Just start your journey, and stuff will emerge as we go. Get over it. If you need to be perfect, it's probably not the world for you. We're going to have a relentless focus on the customer and let them actively drive change by learning off what the customer actually values as we go. Let me temper that slightly. We can't let the customer always determine everything, right? Henry Ford was famous for saying, if I gave them what they want, I would have given them a faster horse. <laughs> right, so and, and there's, a, there's a great similar article written once that said BA should invent requirements. And I absolutely believe that. You can't just do exactly, I mean, you never would have invented an iPhone if you'd just done what a customer wanted, right? So let me temper that slightly. Don't let the customer drive everything. We'll learn from them, though. When we work in this type of world, it gives us a different culture. It's not a fail-safe culture, it's a safe-to-fail culture. If we do fail, it is only within the context of an iteration, and we can use that failure to learn so that we can improve. It's a feedback loop. That then might give us a piece of a plan, with the acceptance that we will figure out other pieces of the plan as we go and learn. So, we will take a piece of this concept and vision and we will run some experiments with the market to validate is our idea here a complete pile of poo or is our idea here actually, does it have some legs? Maybe we can reduce risk by testing it with the market quickly. But the only way that can happen is if we have this, a very, very differently structured operations department. One that is based around quality infrastructure, uses lots of automation to reduce their fear of errors, which is what keeps them awake at night, focusing on flow-based delivery and customer focus, and so that operations can be seen as a value center. They're part of the value chain to the customer, not a necessary evil, but a very, very important step. So now we've got 
our initial little piece of hypothesis through to the customer, and the customer's got something that they can come back to uh, us and give us feedback on. So we call this a validated learning cycle. We can now go and talk to the customer around, hey, that thing we did, what did you think? Was it cool? Did it suck? Was it okay? What would we do better? If you were to have a new feature, what would that feature be? Let's learn from them. We can use that to reduce risk, get some data to validate whether our idea was a good idea in the first place, and rinse and repeat. So now we, we've got a bit more information, we might pivot, we might change direction. Look, here's a new thing we could do, and so on and so forth. And lo and behold, it kind of turns out that if you do this, you end up with happy customers. It's quite amazing, because they've actually participated in the whole thing as we've gone. So that's how an agile company tends to think. It's kind of a little bit different. And it's how you actually get value out of agile delivery. You can't sandwich it with non-agile thinking. So DevOps has largely solved a lot of this problem. And the, the, the continuous delivery movement has solved a lot of this problem. It is very, very commonplace now. LinkedIn used this to go live six times a day. It's not having to wait once a month to go live anymore. So um, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail around Scrum. I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, it is, in essence, a very light framework. It's got some very, very clear roles and responsibilities. It doesn't tell you how to do engineering practices like write code, test code. It doesn't tell you how to be a BA. Um, it's brutally honest, and it is ridiculously simple. It's three roles, five key events, and three artifacts, and that's it. Um, it's very, very difficult to master because it is ridiculously, brutally honest about what's happening um, because underpinning it is transparency. Um, so the three pillars of Scrum, what it's based on, it's based on the belief that if we can have transparency around the work, we can make decisions based around the transparency of the work that allows us so we can inspect the work and based on the reality of what's going on, we can make adaptions as we go. So this idea, almost like a heat-seeking missile, that we can look at what's happening now, and if the target's changed, we change with it. Um, and there's a video here, I've, I'll, I'll release these slides so you can follow through on this. There's a, the, this is the, most of the videos out there on what is Scrum are, are absolute rubbish, to be honest. Um, this is one from Lisa Atkins. It's mostly right, um, but I'm gonna pull her up on this. There's a few things in there that aren't right. Um, she's got, the daily scrum is a, is a commitment meeting. It is not a commitment meeting. It is a daily planning meeting. It is where we get together as a team and use the evidence of what was done pr um, yesterday to figure out what's the best thing to do in the next 24 hours. Um, and the other thing she's got wrong is the sprint review. It is not a show and tell or a demo. It's a complete misconception. The whole point of a sprint review is to look at the piece of software we've just delivered and based on the evidence of what we see in that piece of software, to figure out what should we do in the next iteration. So the outcome of a sprint review is an updated product backlog. That's the point of it. It's not a demo where we look at the software, clap our hands and walk away and go, well, that was nice. The point is to look at the software and use that to decide what to do next. What's our next optimal move in the backlog? Um, what is Kanban? Again, I haven't come here to teach you that. You can read that in your own time. Here's a suggested video, Kanban in five minutes. Read about it. Um, you should be doing this if you're interested in Agile, educate yourself. Um, but what I will try and wrap this up with is some common failure scenarios that we often see. Um, this is the first one. In particular, when you get going with Agile, the frameworks like Scrum and Kanban exist for very, very good reasons. Scrum hasn't just been some little idea that someone came up with that they think might work now and then. It has been using, using science and psychology and trial and error it has been refined over a very long time to, with each of the, the events in Scrum playing a very, very important role. You don't just whip them out because they don't suit you and you don't like what you see in the mirror. If you don't like, if sprint planning is failing for you or your sprint retrospective shows you that you're really, really crappy at, at testing, fix the problem. Don't take the retrospective away. So a lot of people do this in Agile. They think it, in Scrum in particular, they think I'll drop the bits that are really ugly and painful and make me wince. Don't do that. Be honest. Don't change the mirror if you look like that. Change what you look like. 
Um, doing the mechanics without understanding the philosophy is a very, very common scenario. I talked about it before with the Agile mindset. When people just blindly follow the process and haul out the scrum guide and say, on page 14 it says. If you don't understand why it says, then you've kind of missed the point. You've really got to understand the thinking behind it. And remember, something like the scrum guide is, in essence, a number of different books condensed down into 16 pages. There is a huge amount between the lines, and you need to really stop and reflect on each of those sentences in there to think about what is it they're actually saying. Um, the other one we see is Agile from the neck down, where the organisation is still governed or run or controlled in a very, very traditional model. So the, the head is alien to the body, and they tend not to talk to each other. And Agile will start to bang up against the edge of the organisation and it will either reject the head or the head will reject the body. It's very difficult to get the two of them talking without some careful planning and thought about that. Um, reading a book and just doing it, uh, which is the most common scenario. Um, I see a lot of places that have just said to their people, here you go, here's a scrum book, read it, how hard can it be? Go on, we'll start on Monday. It just doesn't work. Just like reading a book on how to be rich. You don't just go out and then on Monday you're rich. It doesn't work that way, sorry. Um, it takes years of, of, of practice and often some assistance. Um, and the other one, doing it without telling your manager. Um, Scrum is based, it, it, it's a, it stealth is a known pattern for implementing Agile. It has been used. It always ends in tears because no manager wants to look like a complete idiot that they don't know what the hell's going on. So it's not a very inclusive and it's not a very transparent way to do it. So I'd encourage you to avoid that one unless it's really extreme. Um, the way, uh, I've been at this for a number of years. I've tried a number of different models. Um, pretty much everything I could possibly think of. Um, probably the worst was given a 48 hour budget to try and implement Agile in an organisation, uh, which was kind of disastrous. Um, through to being parked up for six months in an organisation. Um, the best way I know of is the sort of um, C1, um, or sort of teach one, C1, do one model. We, we tend to sort of start with a bit of education to get everyone on a level playing field. We then come in and take over and, and run a few iterations and show it actually working, and coach and develop, and then ease off, take the, to, to a model where we're just the trainer wheels, and slowly those trainer wheels come off and voila, you're riding a bike. Um, so I'm not trying to do a pitch, but you know, if you do have Agile coaches available or, you, or you're thinking about doing this, the value of an Agile coach is ridiculous. They will take you months and months and months down the road of what would normally be trial and error and failure. They will help you leapfrog and avoid a lot of those pitfalls. Um, and there's also the thing to be aware of is there is a truckload of other stuff that happens. One of the secrets in particular of Scrum is that the point of Scrum is to highlight and every single deficiency you have in your organisation and to put them in your face. And the point is, so you can fix them. That's how you become very, very efficient. Not by running away from your weaknesses, but from addressing them in the mirror and fixing them. And Scrum slaps you in the face with that every two weeks and reminds you that you need to improve. So the sorts of things that tend to come up is communication in most organisations is pretty shoddy. Um, technical practices are often really, really shoddy. Look at the example I gave you earlier of how many of you are using like, XP type practices. Um, so things like testing becomes really, really, really important quickly because otherwise you're doing the same regression testing every single damn sprint and it becomes really wasteful. Um, things like continuous deployment, so releasing software frequently, the inability to do that starts hitting you in the face every couple of weeks. The idea of um, the teams, when they start demanding from product owners, tell us what is the most valuable things that our customers want. And a number of, most of the product owners I work with, I ask them one simple question to start with. When was the last time you went and sat and watched your customers use your software? And the answer is, never. Very rarely happens. So how the hell can they understand what customers care about and value? So value becomes very, very clear, very, very evident quickly. Um, the ability to manage a portfolio of projects becomes very, very evident because people are trying to shove three or four projects through a scrum team and they're having to switch all over the place and there's waste everywhere. Um, and so we, oh, I'm going to skip evidence-based management, we're sort of low on time. 
Um, so that's it. That's all I really wanted to share with you. Um, I'm going to share these slides out, follow up on some of the resources. Um, I would really strongly also encourage you, get active on our LinkedIn group. Um, the, the Agile Auckland has a LinkedIn group with nearly 2,000 members. Um, most of the people in there putting stuff are just us in the committee. Use it to ask questions. Use it as a community to support one another. Use it to share presentations, talk to each other. A lot of what you'll learn is, is support from one another and resources that you find useful. So thank you for your time. I hope you've learned something tonight um, and we'll make these slides available um, for you to follow through on. Thank you. session uh, I would like us to try open space formula uh, I will skip maybe the principles oh we on the slide do there's five six maybe questions uh, if you have a chance to look at it you can do that now uh, let me go to slide dot do uh, hashtag APN you can see the questions you can vote on the on the questions uh, there's already a few questions and we'll choose four more most voted questions. We have four uh, spaces. First one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one in the, in the back. Uh, in topics or questions that you are most interested in, just uh, go there and we'll have a 15 minute, minutes time box discussion around those four issues. Uh, if it's possible, the authors of the questions, if they can go to the own uh, question that will be very useful uh, so they can give more uh, input to the team. After that, we'll do some short summary to the whole group, to the whole audience. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, I will open now the uh, slide. Yes, uh, in each of the corners, there will be also one of our uh, committee members, which is experienced, will, which will help you to go through your concerns and questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have those four most popular questions. How do you find the correct way to implement the practices derived from agile mindset for your project? It will be the first corner. Uh, what does an agile-minded project team look like? The second one, oh, it's changed, okay. <laughs> Agile minded project team look like it's the first corner, uh, it's the second one, the third one, uh, can you work in an agile environment in an industry company? It's the, in the, in the side there. And the fourth one, what is the, what is the play? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not, not, not sure what to do now. You need to give some time for the people to talk to the Yeah, okay. Yeah. So let's let's uh, give him one minute. Good suggestion. Thank you. Then I'll s disconnect the internet. Okay, uh, thank you. I would like to ask you to stop voting. Uh, we are doing that the f for the first time here, so sorry for issues. Uh, so, can you work in an agile environment in an industry company? Uh, the second one, what is the place of project management in agile? Is he useful? Uh, the third one, how can agile integrate with other aspects of the organization, budgets, accounting, and so on? The third one, and the fourth one, uh, what does an Agile-minded project team look like. Okay, so I would like to stand up, go to areas or to, to the spaces that you are interested in.
and let's start a 15 minute discussion. It will end at.